everyone. We want to welcome into the studios today Dr. Cliff Morris. We have an exciting subject to talk about today. I, I trust that everyone uh, will enjoy what you have to share with us uh, about, um, about Israel. Uh, you, you traveled to Israel, you took a group to Israel, you may have more than once, but I know you did yes, uh, yeah. about six, seven years ago. Right. Yeah. People love to travel to Israel. Believers have that desire. And, you know, many times, Cliff, you, you hear people say that you talk of Israel, you say, you say you know, uh, there's a group going and, and, you know, people say, oh, especially, oh, I wish I had gone. I, I wish, right. wish I had gone. I always wanted to go to Israel. Right. Um, yeah. I've been four times. I would go every year if I could, if I could drum up a group every year. Um, I've never had anybody in any of those experiences wish they hadn't gone or wish they got, could get their money back or they were disappointed in the experience. Virtually everybody comes back saying, that touched my heart more than I thought it would. It really it was a, a life-shaping thing. Yeah. Uh, people of deep faith and, and a lot of Bible knowledge. Still, it takes it to another level because you're there. It's, uh, I mean, you can relate to a lot of historical things, battlefields or whatever in America that your understanding's better because you're there. But going to Israel just turns the lights on for the Holy Land. Uh, one lady that's here in town that went with us back in 2000 on the first trip from Dublin said, now I see it in color. I mean, that's her way of describing it. It's like it's been black and white before, but now I see it in color. It just things had come alive to her. So yeah. there's just something about that part of the experience. Yeah. It's probably emotional, too. Yeah, and you're traveling with other people that are there for the same reasons. Very few people go just because they think it's uh, a great place to get good food or whatever. I mean, everybody's there for on a spiritual pilgrimage, pretty much. They're, they've studied the Bible all their lives or... Uh, they're trying to sort that out, and so it's just everybody's there to to see the biblical story unfold firsthand. How do you, first of all, while the travel from here to there is uh, a feat in itself? You know, it's, I mean, it's, it's a pretty it's, long trip. Yeah. Uh, it involves at least one good long flight to get across the Atlantic. Uh, sometimes you can go nonstop, but that's rare. Yeah. Uh, some people fly from Atlanta to. Turkey or Greece or something and then down. It just depends on the airline. Uh, sometimes you fly from Atlanta to New York and get on a plane that goes straight into Jerusalem so or to Israel. So it just depends and uh, tour companies put that together and find the best deals at the time and what you end up doing kind of has to do with some of that, what yeah. your priorities are too. So one would definitely want to go with a group. Well, at least in the, probably your first trip, unless you had, I mean, it's, it's kind of risky to just, not, it's not dangerous, but it's, you could waste a lot of time and money roaming around and not know what you were looking at uh, if you were just on your own for the first time. So, so. When, you, when you plan a trip, w what type of, of order do you uh, go in? Uh, you know, what's the plan? You arrive in, in the airport and where do you go from there? What do you? Well, most trips are with a tour company and they, Almost all of them follow the same pattern. The airport for Israel is right in the middle of the country, so it's not in Jerusalem, it's not in Tel Aviv, it's sort of in between them, Ben Gurion Airport. So a typical trip will arrive, and depending on the time of day that your trip gets there, you'll go from there, if it's late, just go on into Tel Aviv, which is their big city. It has no biblical significance other than it's near some things of biblical significance, but it's a, a modern city created for new Israel, uh, but you go and spend the night there and get up the next day, and then you begin this loop uh, that goes around. Usually you go north to the Galilean area <coughs> and uh, tour that, and then work your way down south to the Dead Sea and then back up to Jerusalem, and the closing days of a trip are built around Jerusalem. So that's a typical trip. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in beginning, you, you go to the Sea of Galilee. And that, early on in the trip, yeah. And to me, that's my favorite part of it. Some people, it's Jerusalem. Both, it's hard to compare them in terms of the spiritual significance of it or the value to your experience. But uh, the Sea of Galilee is profound to me. It's an exciting place. And so when you go, do you bring a message? Do you, you teach and reflect yeah. on it? Yeah. I mean, you can go with some 
the, the guides, the Israeli guides, tend to be uh, Jewish, non-practicing Jews. With you know, so they they're very great guides, and they're well trained, and they have to be certified, and they know enough New Testament to be able to quote some verses or say, "This is what you're looking for here." But there's a difference in that and, and it being in their heart. And so uh, I like the idea of a, there being a teaching pastor or somebody or a scholar, somebody on the trip that really knows what you're looking at and why you're looking at it and what you're supposed to get from that spiritually as you're on those locations. So, so, so. reflect uh, the first the Sea of Galilee and the lessons uh, message, the the point that you would like to draw near and make sure that people realize that this yeah. is... Yeah. I brought along a picture. We took a trip in 2000 out of Dublin, and we had a mix of people, mostly from First Baptist Church, not all, but uh, Mary Lou Coulter, who's now at home with the Lord, went on that trip. She was the senior part of that group, uh, and she did great. Everybody was anxious about her. She did better than the people half her age on the trip. But she would take pictures and come home and draw what she saw and, and had pictures to go by. So she came back and drew this picture. I don't know how well that'll show up on camera. Uh, pretty simple art, but this is a picture of the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is about 12 miles from top to bottom. And at the widest spot, it's an odd shape, but at the widest spot, it's about seven miles across. So it's not really a sea, it's a big lake. Uh, but it's in a, a really beautiful, it's in a bowl. So almost all the way around it, you're looking into hillside. There are a couple of cuts in that of significance. But this uh, picture she took and later painted was on the northwest corner of the Sea of Galilee which is a place of huge significance biblically. Uh, there are two names for that site. One is Tabga, like T-A-B-G-H-A, -A, Tabga. And most Israelis will refer to it as Tabga. The, the guides will call it that, and it'll be on the maps as Tabga. And that's sort of a modern Arab corruption of the old Greek name uh, for it the Greek name because that area has been changed hands down through the timeline of history. When the Greeks under Alexander swept through and conquered the map, uh, they brought Greek culture to the area, especially up in the Galilean region. And a lot of things carried names or there's architecture or remains of that time frame. But they named that northwest corner the, the shore at the northwest corner of the Sea of Galilee, Heptapagon, like H-E-P-T-A-P-A-G-O-N, maybe, uh, Heptapagon, which means seven springs, or the place of seven springs. And springs, there are seven springs, you, you won't see them if you go there, but they're there somewhere, or they have been, and the Greeks had identified those as significant to that site. And the springs, have a different temperature of water from the Sea of Galilee. So that water works its way down into the sea in that corner and fish like it. And because fish like it, fishermen like it. And because fishermen like it, people like James and John and Simon Peter and Andrew, Philip, those guys went there to fish. And you can see that today on the boats. People still fish there. Of course, there are tour boats in the area. It's not congested at all. It's random, rare, or does something go by? But uh, people still fish there. It's still uh, important. But that's a profoundly important New Testament site because at that location, Jesus calls those first disciples off the boat. And uh, Peter and James and John are business partners and out there every day or working the fish with their boats and sometimes pulling nets between two boats and different versions of fishing. And that plays into so many of the stories of Jesus. And so they are called off the boats there. And there's a first call of the disciples and it comes back along. And then after that, they're with him for the next three years. Uh, the sons of Zebedee walk off and say farewell to dad. Very emotional time. I mean, they've worked with their dad in the family business. Yeah and they walk away from that. And that's not the last time they see their dad because they're there often, uh, but they have made a break to a new calling to follow Jesus and be his disciples. 
and James doesn't live a real long time, but Peter does, and John lives a real long time after that and uh, writes the closing books of the New Testament. Uh, so that takes place in that setting, but there are many stories and the teaching of the parables and all that takes place in that location. If you study the four Gospels, you can track it back to Heptapagon or Tabga. Uh, there comes a time when Jesus is sailing by that en route to another location on the other side of the sea, and people see him coming, and they make an assumption that Jesus is going to Tabga uh, because he went there so often. And so they're running along the shore, and so Jesus has his disciples pull aside and go up there and teaches them all day long, ministers to the, to the sick people there, and at the end of the day, they have a problem because there's not enough food. And so there's the, the story of the feeding of the 5,000. All four Gospels tell that story. Uh, John and Matthew were there to experience that, but they feed the multitude, and then he puts them in the boat, and they go across the sea. But that's marked out by the early church. There's a church that's built over where a church was. It's built over the remains of an, another church that goes way back into church history. And the early Christians said, this is where that happened. And it's right there, maybe 100 yards inland from the Sea of Galilee on that northwest corner. Uh, this is kind of what it looks like. These are really place mats that you can buy in a store in Jerusalem. Uh, and you can see, this is that corner I'm describing. You can see the trees down close to that. And this is the Sea of Galilee. This is uh, the Church of the Beatitudes, which is about 90 years old, built by Italians under the reign of Mussolini of all people, but they built that to honor the Beatitudes that begin the Sermon on the Mount. But the Sermon on the Mount's not really preached there. The real site is down there at Tabga, at Heptapagon. Uh, that, that, that site is just so loaded uh, with biblical material. Oh, it's not just store, but the, the heavy duty things are down there. So uh, this picture I took, and it's not a great picture, but this is standing down there near, uh, just like inland from the Sea of Galilee and turning around and looking on up the hill. There's some bob wire at the top that's protecting an area that's really largely unexcavated. And there's up there, there's a foundation to a church that was built by early, early, early Christians to mark that site out as the site of the Sermon on the Mount. So that's another Heptapagon site where Jesus preaches maybe his greatest message, uh, the Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount. That takes place in that setting. Hi, I'm Kyle Gerard with A-Plus Flooring and Construction. We're in our showroom, and I want to show you some of the new products that we have. We have a complete line of ceramic tile from Premier Tile. We also have the new Chesapeake LVP display, as well as a lot of our shawl carpet displays. We'd love for you to come down and shop with us here at A-Plus Flooring and Construction. A couple new things that we have. We have a brand new complete line of cabinets. We also have our new metal roof distributor for metal roofs here in town, as well as shingle roofs. We can supply all your needs at A-Plus Flooring and Construction. So come see us at 371 Georgia Highway 338 or give us a call at 478-676-2662. Mid-State Pools and Spas carries an outstanding line of hot tubs. Adding a spa to your deck or patio is a great and affordable way to spice up your backyard area. Hydrotherapeutic reasons are pleasure. We can help you find the right spa that fits your needs. All our spas range from a seating capacity of two to upwards of seven in our signature collection. And there's also different cabinet colors to choose from too, so that you can pick out the right color that best fits your area. There's several different add-ons that can be implemented to make your spa even more enjoyable. That's Mid-State Pools and Spas, the ultimate hot tub experience. After the resurrection, Jesus tells his disciples that they're to meet him in the Galilee. Well, that's like saying, meet me in Georgia. How would they know where to go? 
uh, you know, we need to, uh, an address or something was how we would think as Americans. They knew exactly where to go. They were to go to that site. They would go to the, the site that had been Jesus' mission station for three years. Uh, and so they arrived there, and the scriptures record five known apostles and a couple other disciples that are there. They were probably not part of the twelve. And they're fishing, and they're, they're not doing anything wrong fishing. They're just waiting on Jesus to show up because he's told them to go there. And then he appears on the side and feeds them breakfast. Uh, there's the, in that context, Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? And he does it three times. And Peter, by the third time, Peter's upset because it's, why are you questioning this? And it's really a, a process Jesus takes him through to restore him to full discipleship. And then Peter says, Peter's always got to say one more thing. So he says, and what about him pointing to John? And he says, if I want him to, to remain until I come back, what's that to you? You follow me. And so uh, John records that for us. But those are, that's the two men that were closest to Jesus, and they're right there in that setting. But that takes place right there in that same location. All of, you could sit there within 100 yards. You could see all of those stories took place right there. And there are no signs. Uh, there are a couple of little church buildings that are there. But it's not, I mean, you just got to know the story and know that's where it happened. And so Jesus, it's not in one of the cities of the time. It's not a New Testament city. That's another mile down over to the east uh, toward Capernaum or south to Tiberias. But it's just out there in a remote location where Jesus did ministry. And people came often there looking for him thinking, what's he going to be doing there today? So he operates out of that location when he's not powerful in the south. Is. Yeah. How powerful I'm yeah. sure to stand there and to, to just yeah. have that time with the Lord. Right. It's, it's a, an, an incredible place. And uh, the last time we went, I told our guide, he's a real nice guy, but he was a Jewish soldier, uh, airborne major that had semi-retired out of the military and was a guide. And he knew a lot, but uh, I said, you know, just give us some time, an hour or so here. And we sat down. There's an outdoor chapel there. It's, it's really a Catholic chapel, but anybody can use it. And we just sat down there for about an hour and talked about some of the things I just talked about. And, and you're sitting there as you're, you're in that setting, you're looking out into the Sea of Galilee across those sites and imagining those disciples coming off those boats there or Jesus out on a boat talking back up off the water into that setting. So, anyhow, the Sea of Galilee is usually the first major area of study. Yeah. And uh, from there, usually you go north to a strange site, a very Greek site called Caesarea Philippi. And one of the sons of Herod the Great, named Philip, he's Herod of Philip, uh, rebuilt an old Greek city up there, and he named it Caesarea after Caesar and Philippi after himself. Very humble. Uh, but it retained a lot of the Greek culture and the paganism that was there. You're really kind of getting out of Jewish territory when you get up there. And in the Bible, Jesus uh, deliberately takes them. I'm not sure that, I don't think I have a picture of that with me. I had a postcard somewhere. Maybe you can plug one of those in. Uh, Jesus deliberately takes the disciples up there to that setting because it is so pagan, because it is a spiritually repulsive place. And they've been with him now for a long time, almost three years. And he takes them up there and puts them in a place. And you look up into the hillside, and there's a, a cave there today. In that time, there was a, I describe it, it looks sort of like City Hall downtown in Dublin with the columns. There was a Greek temple built out of the front of that cave. And the source of the Jordan River would flow up out of the, that cave through those columns and begin the Jordan River. So in that, instead of windows beside that, like at City Hall, imagine niches that are cut into the rock and little pagan demonic deities are plugged in there. The Greek god Pan, uh, Pan pipes that you blow over like you see in especially yeah. Latin yeah. American music comes out of the Pan was a Greek god worship there and you'll see the little figures in stone where they're blowing on pipes. So it has roots in that. So it's a very pagan place. And they saw that source of water coming up there as like a source of life and 
all kind of strange ways of worship going on there. So Jesus takes them there and he says, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And some say, well, some say John the Baptist. Some say, well, maybe Elijah, because he's anticipated as the forerunner to the Messiah. Maybe Jeremiah, or maybe just one of the prophets. And then Jesus says, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter speaks up. His, his name's Simon at that point, really, but he speaks up and he says, you are the Christ, you're the Son of the living God. And it's the perfect answer. That's an A-plus on his theology exam. And Jesus said, you didn't come up with that on your own. God's given you that insight, that truth. Well, and he says, and you are Petros, which is Greek for Peter. That's going to be your name now. I'm going to call you Petros. Uh, and then he says, and upon this Petra, I'll build my church. So there's about six variants of what you, or options for how you interpret that, what you see in that. Uh, what's, what's Petra? If Petra says Peter, what's Petra? Is that just another way of saying Peter? The, the Roman Catholic Church sees it as such and says he's making him the first pope at that point. Uh, some say, no, it has to do with the location itself. Uh, one Protestant approach to it is, no, it's the theology of what Peter just said. On that, what you just said, I'm going to build my church. Yeah. Uh, I suggest that if Peter's Petras, Petra is all of the disciples there, Paul writes about building the church on the foundation of the prophets and the apostles. And so here are the apostles gathered, and I think he's saying, you rock, and on all this rock, I'm going to build my church. Now, the translations into English render what comes next two different ways, like a New American Standard, which is my favorite translation, but I don't, I'm least comfortable with how they render that. They say, I will build my church and the gates of hell, and I think Jesus gestures back at that temple at that point that's behind them, and they're looking at it, and that's known as the gates of hell. He says, even the gates of hell will not overpower you. You, I, in other words, I'm going to take care of you as you build a church. Well, that's a wonderful truth. It can be biblically proved elsewhere, but I think Jesus meant at least something else, maybe in addition to that. And the King James translators 400 years ago picked up on that and translated, I think, the best way. The gates of hell will not prevail against you, which puts the church not on defense, but on offense. And he's saying, you're going to go forth from this crazy place here, and you're going to build the church. I'm going to be with you, but not visibly, but you're going to build the church, and all of hell out there is not going to prevail against you. You will prevail over that. Uh, but that takes place at Caesarea Philippi. And then they pack up, and they head south, and they on a slow migration that will eventually take them to Jerusalem and the great events of the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. So Caesarea Philippi is sort of a, a graduation ceremony for the apostles. But... It's sort of um, a turning point in his ministry, and he's telling them it's, it's getting ready to get really serious. It's been serious a number of places already, but it's getting ready to get really serious when we go down to Jerusalem. But you know that I'm with you, and I'm going to build you into a church that will prevail over the darkness of the world. So. Hi, I'm Andy Cullins at Cullins Supply. Cullins Supply is proud to be your Bobcat small equipment dealer. When paths need clearing, buildings need raising, loads need moving, acres needs tending, or anything on your to-do list needs getting done, that's where we come in. Bobcat makes the best equipment to complete the toughest jobs imaginable. Come see the full lineup of Bobcat compact equipment at Cullins Supply and Engine Service, located at 910 East Jackson Street in Dublin, or 826 South Harris Street in Sanderville. Progressive Rural Telephone Co-op offers a full range of communication products and services to its members in Lawrence County and surrounding areas. We take pride in being your total communications provider, and we work hard to provide quality services at the best prices. In addition to offering phone service, we provide high-speed internet and digital high-def TV. And we always strive to put our members first. Progressive Rural, your total communications company. Small enough to know you, large enough to serve you. ProgressiveTel.com. Call 478-984-4201 or stop by 890 Simpson Avenue in Rents. Progressive Rule Telephone Co-op. In 
so you, you, you go through there and then you travel on to Jerusalem as right, well as a tour? Right, right. But you want to go with somebody that knows that story, Pretty you know, cool. where, I mean, you could go up and look at that and say, yeah, and, and you have a little guidebook and have a paragraph on that. And you, it's easy to go into those kind of settings and walk away and it's like, I'll have to read about that when I get home. I didn't quite get that. But you don't want to do You want to get it. You want to get it that day while you're there looking at, oh, I, I see why Jesus did that. I see why he brought him up here. Mm -hmm. This makes sense. Yes. Uh, yeah. Truly a pagan, I mean, to the point of, of uh, very evil worship. Yes, yes. Yeah, just terrible. Uh, yeah. Not far from there is Dan. There's a state park. Dan is uh, like an Israeli park now. Yeah. But the tribe of Dan, when the Israelites first went into the Promised Land, the small tribe of Dan, it's probably the smallest tribe, couldn't really settle their territory down in the south. So they moved up there to the north. And where they located became the weakest link in the chain of Israel. It was where the, the worst pagan idolatry in Israel occurred in that site. That's not far from Caesarea Philippi. So that whole region just has, it's, it's beautiful. It's uh, the prettiest part of Israel in a lot of ways. Yeah. And the, the source of the Jordan River looks cleaner than the water coming out of your tap. It's just, it's perfectly clear and clean. Um, but spiritually, it was a dark place. And that's why Jesus went up there. Do you still so, feel that? Well, if you know the story, you do. I mean, it's nothing, it's not in the air or, I mean, it's not like that. Uh -huh. But if you know the story, you feel that you, you're remembering that, and uh, and if hopefully your guide's bringing that out to you. You know that that's that's why Jesus came there. Yeah. yeah. And then on to Jerusalem. If you want. Yeah. Usually a trip will go from there and turn south. Um, very rarely do you go right up the middle of Israel. In Jesus' day, that would take you through Samaria. So most, the, the Jewish people live largely in the north in Galilee and in the south in Judea. And so to go to Jerusalem, they go, would go east over and go down the Jordan River and then back west at Jerusalem to go around Samaria, not past. It was flatter and you were not going over a lot of hills, but it also avoided the Samaritan culture that they wanted to avoid. And there are times Jesus goes around it like everybody else with the people. And there are times he deliberately goes into Samaria and when he gives his great commission, the, the Luke version of that in Jerusalem, he talks about they, there'll be witnesses in Samaria. You know, so uh, there's, there's nothing off the grid of the great commission. You know, so, uh, but a tour will usually, and you can customize your trip with most tour companies and say, well, we would like, just delete that and we want to add that if we could or whatever. But most trips will go from there south to the Dead Sea, which is very dead, nothing living in it. Um, I might have a, one of my placemats from the Dead Sea. This is Qumran. That's what it looks like uh, along the shore. This is inland a little bit, and there are caves you might can see in this big postcard. Uh, those caves are where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in the 1940s, which is probably the greatest archaeological, historical discovery of the last hundred years. Uh, amazing manuscripts of every book in the Old Testament except the book of Esther came out of those caves. And there was a monastery like scriptorium there where manuscripts were copied. And with the Romans coming in to destroy Israel and, and to totally destroy Jerusalem, I think at that point, a lot of that was stored in those caves and sat there from 70 AD till 1940s uh, when that resurfaced. And it's the, the, the preservation of it's just really amazing, and those ultra dry caves. But the Sea of Galilee is drying up. It, the shoreline is going down largely because the Jordan River is intercepted for irrigation purposes. It's always evaporating because it's the lowest spot on the world not the southernmost spot, but it's below sea level, the lowest spot. And so it's always hot down there, even in the wintertime. And so there's a lot of evaporation coming off. So the, the lake is, uh, the Dead Sea is also really a big lake, but it's, it's shrunk in size. And so you can see where the shoreline was and where it is today. And there are discussions about how to get some water back in there because their best hotels are on the southern end of that. 
But that's an eerie place to visit too because this probably, and different people vary on what they see there, but uh, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah from the book of Genesis are down there somewhere in that Dead Sea setting. It may be under the waters, current waters of the Dead Sea, or more likely over on the southeast shoreline of the Dead Sea. Those cities once existed, and the, the waters were alive with fish. It was, it was not like it is today. And so it's kind of a strange thing. You, people like to swim in the Dead Sea. You float. You can't drown in the Dead Sea. Yeah. It's, it can be dangerous if you swallow it or get it in your eyes, but uh, you, you buoy right up on the surface of the water, and a lot of people like to do mud baths and all that kind of stuff sure. down there. So a big tourist stop. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of biblical significance, so I like to minimize the time there and see it. Halfway up the Dead Sea on the western shore, you come to a place called Ein Gedi, like E-I or E-I-N, separate word, G-E-D-I, Ein Gedi. And if you, there's a little state park type building there and you walk a little trail back inland from that to the west and you come to a waterfall and a big cave up there. And that's the setting, if you know your Old Testament, it's where David, before he's the king, is hiding from King Saul who's pursuing him. And King Saul actually goes into one of those caves and David cuts the corner off his robe to prove that he could have killed him and he didn't. And that's a great story, but that takes place there. And the prophet Ezekiel prophesies the day will come when the waters of Ein Gedi, at that waterfall that's coming out of rock, that that will replenish the water of the Dead Sea and it'll, and it'll come to life again, that there'll be fish again in the Dead Sea. Um, so that's a future to us, still yet future prophecy concerning the Dead Sea. So a, a trip and usually involves going to the Dead Sea yeah. to see the sea, maybe Ein Gedi, uh, and the Dead Sea Scroll Scriptorium there which is not far from the Jordan River. And then things usually gravitate somehow through the Judean wilderness and up to Jerusalem and the sites there. Judean wilderness? Yeah, that's just like south and southeast and southwest of Jerusalem. It just gets very barren and not much down there. Mm -hmm. uh, Beersheba's down there where Abraham had his home uh, at a significant portion of his life. So it does have some biblical history down there. Uh, you go a little north of there and you come to Hebron or Hebron, either way is okay to say. Yeah. Uh, and David lived there and ruled his early years as king from there and the patriarchs are buried there. Most tour guides don't like to go there because it's not as Jewish, it's less Jewish and more Muslim. Uh, but from there you work your way on up a little bit further to Bethlehem. One of the issues with Going to Israel, people will ask, well, is it safe? I don't know if I'd feel safe over there. And I've never felt unsafe there. Maybe I'm foolish, but I've never felt unsafe. There's so much to see, and the guides are so in touch with current events that if something's not okay at Bethlehem, you just don't go down there. You go somewhere else, and there's always somewhere else you can go that is safe. And so you don't feel unsafe, but there's sort of a kidney bean shaped territory called the West Bank that's between the Jordan River and the main part of Israel. So it's on the West Bank of the Jordan. And so that's predominantly Palestinian and not Jewish and has its own government, wants to be its own country and there's a, the politics of that is just huge in our lifetime. Yes. Uh, so my, one of my favorite Old Testament books is the book of Joshua. Well, it's mostly in the West Bank, so it's hard to go see those sites. But you will run out of time before you see everything you'd like to anyhow. So you usually just bypass that unless there's some special arrangement to go in and see those sites. Uh, you can go to Jericho. Uh, I had one guide one trip didn't want to go to Jericho because he was uneasy about the Palestinian unrest there at the time, but I've been to Jericho three times and felt very safe there and the merchants love for, the Palestinian merchants love for Americans to show up and spend some money and sure. buy their stuff and yeah. that site has great significance for the, the Joshua story, but even Jesus' story with uh, Zacchaeus is in Jericho as Jesus is coming through and he climbs up in the sycamore tree and all that's right in that area there. So. Uh, 
And then the, the punctuation of a trip is usually about three days in Jerusalem, which is just overwhelming, the, the biblical significance of it. So. Hi, I'm Brandy, and I would like to invite you to experience our newly renovated mammography suite at the Fairview Park Hospital Breast Center. Our Breast Center has its own dedicated entrance with a relaxing boutique-like waiting area. You can make your appointment online anytime at fairviewparkhospital.com or by calling 478-274-3919. Most appointments take 30 minutes or less and we will have your results back to your doctor within 24 hours. Hello, I'm Jim Tanner from JT's Fall Market. Come out today and see us for all your meat and produce needs. We got sauces and spices for whatever you're cooking up at JT's. Now at JT's, we got JT's Barbecue Shack. We have pulled pork, ribs, chicken, hamburgers, hot dogs, and all the fixings for all your needs. All the beef that we're cooking is locally grown. Come by and see us today at 728 Central Drive, East Dublin, Georgia. Or call in orders at 609-9850. Uh, what do you try to take in there? That, yeah, you know, well, you have to, if you don't plan it, they'll plan it for you. If you don't know what to do, they'll say this is what most people do and take you to the places most people go. If you've been or you've studied and you know, you can kind of customize it to fit what you most want to see there. This is a picture I brought. I hope it shows up on camera okay. This picture belonged to Bill Weeks, who pastored out at Dudley for 100 years, 20-something uh, years, uh, and died too young. And Bill was part Jewish and had a, lo a huge love for Israel and the Holy Land and went almost every year with a group from this area. And he had, he probably took this picture and then had it blown up and framed. And after he passed and a new pastor came, Miss Carol came down and was a part of our church at First Baptist just to give the, the new pastor at Dudley freedom to, to do his thing. And she plugged in. She was an incredible encouragement to me. What a great blessing she is. Lives over in South Carolina now. But she gave me this picture. She says, somebody like you needs to have this picture. And this was Bill's and hung in his office. So it was in my office down at First Baptist for a long, long time. And then I took it home with me and uh, brought it along today just to show that. But this is a picture taken, that perspective looking in at it. You're, you can see a lot of tombs here. These are Jewish tombs. And over on this ridge are Muslim tombs. There's a valley that you can't see in the picture that's in between them. So you go down into that Kidron Valley and back up. And this is the Eastern Gate to Temple Mount. This site, we were talking about this before we started filming. If you could take that dome away, that's a Muslim temple or shrine, the Dome of the Rock. If you went back 3,000 years to the days of David and Solomon, is to that site that David brought the tabernacle and Solomon built the temple. And the reason they wanted it right there, the, the picture here doesn't represent it, but you're coming downhill. This is the old city of Jebus and the Jebusites in the Old Testament, or Salem, um, when Abraham rescues Lot in Genesis. He goes up north and comes back through Salem and meets Melchizedek there, and they become friends, and there's a lot of theology that comes out of that. But that was the old city of Salem, and Jerusalem gets its name from that. But it's built down that slope, uh, the old city of David. At the peak was the threshing floor. It's on the high ground, and you're throwing grain up in the air, and the wind blows the bad stuff away, and you catch the good stuff, and that's how you cleaned up the harvest. And so that's a threshing floor, and it was much more on a point in those days, 3,000 years ago. Uh, 4,000 years ago, Abraham's instructed by God to bring Isaac uh, to that location to sacrifice him, which is an incredible story. As a father or grandfather, you just cringe reading it. The drama of it's amazing. And Abraham uh, withholds nothing from God. Abraham's a great man. There's a reason he's so woven even into the New Testament. Uh, 
couple of goofy things here and there, but you, the, the man, Abraham's tremendous. And he follows those instructions and two of his guides remain at the base of the mountain and he and Isaac go up carrying wood and Isaac asks the question, so where's the sacrifice? It's, the, it's you. And Isaac's old enough to understand at some point what's going on. He says, tie me tight, you know, this is, you know, and God at the last minute stops him and the ram's caught in the thicket and there's a substitution there and that's a type or a picture of the gospel because Jesus is our substitutionary atonement and the ram in the thicket takes Isaac's place and Isaac lives. Jesus takes our place and we live forever because of what Jesus did on the cross. So that's the, the whole temple mount is built around that. A thousand years after Abraham, Solomon builds a temple there. Yeah. That temple is destroyed and another temple is built there. That temple is revised by Herod the Great. But the wall, you can, this is a quite steep wall at this end and shallow at that end. And what the builders of Temple Mount really did was level that, not by bringing it down like we would do. They, they built it up to even with the peak. And Herod the Great raised it up. You can see his stones. His stones all have a frame cut around the edge. So you can say that's definitely a Herodian stone. After that, other groups, the Byzantines and the Crusaders and the Arabs added their layers and this thing has been built up to where it presently is. It's about the size, the whole Temple Mount's about the size of 30 football fields if you stacked them in there in rows. Um, so in the picture, you'll never see it on, on camera, but there's another big dome right back behind that dome. That's the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And there's a long story to that. All trips to Israel, you got to go to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, but you need to know what you're looking at before you go in there. Um, I have a picture maybe in my cards here of that church building. And that's kind of what it looks like. And you see a big dome and a little dome. And if you go there, that has been rebuilt several times. The early church built a building there. Uh, the Byzantines revised it. Uh, the Crusaders built really what's there today. So it's very, very old, but it's gone through revisions. It's a little smaller than it once was in the early days. But the big dome is built over the tomb of Jesus, where the tomb of Jesus would have been. Joseph of Arimathea's tomb that Jesus was buried in. Up toward the front, really not under the little dome, but in front of it where this curvy piece of the building is, that's the site. Or some say it's right under this square corner here. Others say it's right under there. You can look at Joel Kramer's videos on YouTube and he talks about this site a lot and does a great job with that. But that would be the site of the crucifixion. So you can, uh, if you know what you're looking at, this is the, the Eastern Gate and the Kidron Valley. And at the base where these trees are, on the other side of those trees, not visible in this picture, is the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus prays the night before he's crucified. So there's almost a perfectly straight line, if you get in the right position, straight line from the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus prayed through the Eastern Gate to the site of the temple to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. There's the gospel all lined out for you. And when Jesus is praying with such weight the night before the crucifixion, he's looking up from that rock you see in the stained glass and in the artwork. He's looking up from that through that gate and at the temple the, symboli the theology of the temple, the Old Testament temple, is the gospel, that there's these sacrifices that are looking toward the ultimate sacrifice. And then there behind that is the site where he'll be crucified the next day. And he would have understood all that. Uh, so that's the burden of the prayers of the Garden of Gethsemane. So the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, a lot of people, I've been with people who went in it and came out and said, I didn't understand anything I was looking at in there. And it's crowded and it's chaotic. It's almost like Jerusalem would have been the day that Jesus was crucified there. But it's an authentic site. There are two sites for the cross. One's not authentic. One is, that's the real one. It's the one with the ancient history. Uh, Emperor Hadrian in the second century despised the church and all things Christian. And so he's the one that built a wall across 
England, to divide England from Scotland. He did all kind of construction. But down in Israel, at Jerusalem, he said, well, where do the Christians worship? We want to desecrate that. We want, as we rebuild Jerusalem in our image, we want to make sure we wipe out their stuff. And so over that site where that church is, he built a big, huge temple to two Roman gods at, to desecrate it. But what he did was he marked out those sites, the authenticity of those sites, because he goes back not that far after the death of the Apostle John, and he says, this is where the Christians worship, so we're taking that. 300s A.D., Constantine comes to Christ, the Emperor Constantine. His mother becomes a believer with a zeal for restoring the biblical sites. She goes to Jerusalem and says, where was Jesus crucified? And they say, well, Hadrian desecrated the site. It's under Hadrian's temple. So she's the emperor's mom. She says, and got all the money of the empire. She says, we'll take that down and we're going to put a church there that honors Jesus. And that's exactly what they did. So the Church of the Holy Sepulchre marks out that site. So its, it's authenticity goes back to the earliest years of Christianity, uh, that that's the actual location. It's almost like uh, you've been to the theaters and seen plays, and you've got all this, the props and all on one stage. And the sovereignty of God and God's providence, he sets that stage. Joseph of Arimathea has a cemetery on that location because he wants to be buried. He's a wealthy Jew and he wants to be buried near the, as close as you can get to the temple. So just outside the wall, he builds his own little cemetery there and the centerpiece of the cemetery is his tomb and there are graves today that you can go in if you want to. People crawl in and out of them. Stone cut graves so there is zero doubt that was a first century tomb area uh, or cemetery. The tomb of Jesus has been scraped off by Hadrian's crowd, and what's there now is a man-made tomb to honor the authentic tomb that was there. Uh, so it's a very authentic site. You know you're in a cemetery because all these first century tombs are there. Uh, and in the center of that is the place of Jesus' tomb. Well, not very far, from, just a hundred feet or so over, you begin to get into the area of the crucifixion. So on the big stage that God providentially put there is this place of execution. Jesus probably dies back where that dome is, looking back toward the gold dome that was not there. The temple was there. So he's dying looking into the backside of the Holy of Holies of the temple, which represents who he is and how his role as Messiah when, he's, when he does die, the scripture says the veil of that temple is torn. As he's looking into the backside of it, that opens up, you know. All that's gone. That building is long gone. The Romans destroyed that building. But that's what Jesus would have been looking, like, looking at from that setting. So it's a, just an incredible sight. I mean, it's like, this is it. It's, yeah. it's, all, it's not like once upon a time and a land far away. It's, it's, this is real cut and dried history and time and space and it all makes sense when you see it and Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus who comes to Jesus in John chapter 3 those two men come and ask for permission to take the body of Jesus and they're both members of the Sanhedrin so they're movers and shakers it'd be like two U.S. senators in America and they're given permission to take down the body and they prepare the body and take it just a few feet over and place him in Joseph's tomb and there he is until Sunday morning when the resurrection occurs. So it's all right there in that setting. So it's, it's like, if you understand it, and you need to study a lot before you go, if you go, and read after you get back. But you need, when you're looking at it, you need to get it. Or be with somebody that can help you get it and comprehend it. Uh, I have a picture. If you wonder what, since Jesus' tomb is not there, there's just the dome over where it was. I have a picture, maybe, of what that would have looked like. And this is not his tomb. I hope that shows up on camera. I love this picture. This is a perfect representation of the tomb Jesus would have been buried in. This tomb is about a quarter mile from Jesus' tomb. It's first century. It was a cemetery for the Herodian family. 
Herod's the one that tried to kill the babies yes. in Bethlehem. And his family had a cemetery there, a rich man's cemetery. They could have had built it any way they wanted to. This is what they built. And this goes down, it's cut down into rock. You can see the opening. This is plugged with a sheet of metal to keep people out of there now, modern day sheet of metal in there. But you can see the round stone there that would roll over in front of that, behind this, but in front of the tomb. And that would be rolled into position and sealed. And when you get to that point, there's a trench there, and that stone would kind of slip down about six inches into that, where it'd be very hard to get it back up and out of there, and then it's sealed. So Jesus' tomb that Joseph built for himself would have looked just like these Herodians' tombs that were just a quarter mile over. Uh, from the exact same time frame. So that's what it looked like. Uh, and when uh, the women come first and Peter and John come on Sunday morning and, and they're looking in the tomb, uh, that's what they would have seen. It would have looked just like that uh, without the, the sheet of metal there. And that goes down into a, a small little room chamber where several bodies could have been. And the, the Bible says that Peter and John when they get word from the women that Jesus is not there, they take off running and they run like crazy. And John's in better shape and younger probably and he outruns Peter and he gets there first and he stops at the edge of that and looks in. But he's not sure if he sh it's appropriate to go in. Peter gets there and he's the spontaneous wild man, you know, and he just goes right in. Uh, and then they deal with the reality. The body's not there anymore and they see the evidence of... Uh, the grave cloths there and that kind of thing. So that's what it would look like. So uh, you will not see Jesus' tomb. You can go in this thing that the church has built, uh, this sort of like going into a tomb. You had to lean over to kind of go in it, but it's just all stone, and, but it's under that big dome. So the building means nothing. What the building covers means everything. That's the centerpiece of our faith. Jesus died there for us. Jesus rose again on the third day there for us. Welcome, fans. It's time for Friday Night Football. And now, from Farmer State Bank, Ben Knight. Ben Knight, what do you got for us? Ron, we have a ton of excitement tonight, dedication, and a commitment to excellence. Come be a part of our team at Farmer State Bank. And join us on Friday night as we celebrate the Crusaders, the Fighting Irish, the Falcons, and the Raiders. And remember, it's as easy as FSB. Equal housing lender, member FDIC. What a beautiful uh, story that you've laid out. Yeah. Uh, the, the order and the, the well, it's understanding. A, yeah, the... the the story is just profound, the biblical story. Um, but to put it into reality, to, to see it, to, to go, but to understand the, the, the visual as you described. Yeah. Well, and you need to, it needs to be just not knowledge we get of the past, but what do we do with that now and with the balance of our lives? Take the gold dome away and put the temple there not Solomon's, it's gone, but Herod has rebuilt a fabulous building. It's probably the outstanding building in the world of the day. And that's on that site. And so Jesus goes there in the book of Matthew with his disciples. And the disciples, just like you and I would, if we were standing outside Westminster Abbey in London, we'd be saying, hey, Jesus, did you see the architecture? Isn't that an amazing building? And the disciples are doing that with Jesus. I mean, Jesus knows all, <laughs> he knows things they'll never understand about the temple. And he says, he blows them away. He says, not one stone's going to be left upon another. And it's like, whoa, what if I took you on a trip to London? That would be fun. Uh, that's another day. But if I said, you know, in a few years, this Abbey's going to be gone, what would you want to know? What in the world are you talking about? When's that going to occur? Well, Matthew 24 and 25 are called the Olivet Discourse. A discourse is a teaching session of Jesus. So they went out of the Temple Mount, through the gate, down in the valley, and up on this hillside. This is the Mount of Olives. Uh, from the camera angle, you're on the Mount of Olives looking back at the temple, if, imagining that's the temple. And they come back to Jesus and say, could you please explain what you were talking about? 
we're, it's driving us crazy. It's really what this thing is. Yeah. So we got to know when is this going to happen and what is it going to be like. And so Matthew 24 and 25, that Olivet Discourse, is some of Jesus' greatest teaching. So what do we need to know today? What do we need to know for 2023? Well, Jesus says in that teaching, they're worried about what's going to happen to Jerusalem? What's going to happen to our world? And Jesus says, this gospel of the kingdom is going to be preached to all nations for witness, and then the end will come. And so there's, that's the answer, guys. The Romans are going to bring all this down in 40 years. It's not one stone upon another, and they literally did that. They left... They, they messed up the wall. Everything in the temple was pushed over the wall. Back on this back corner, there are piles of rock that had been sitting there since 70 A.D. where Romans pushed temple stones over and they broke up. Uh, but Jesus says, I'm coming back here, but it's going to be after you take this message to every nook and cranny of the globe, to Papua New Guinea and Mozambique and... Southeast Asia, Vietnam, you're going to take it to every corner of the globe, and then I'll come. And so that, that takes it from great history and spiritual history, inspiring history, to like, this is what the church does today. Back to Caesarea Philippi, uh, Jesus said the church will prevail. That was the whole message up there at Caesarea Philippi. The, the gates of hell will not prevail against you. You will take, you, you have a story to tell to the nations that will turn their hearts to the right, the old song said. Uh, and so, in the Olivet Discourse, he's saying, don't get caught up in this. Get caught up in the Great Commission. And so, uh, the message for us today, if you go to Israel, it's fun to look back and remember all the stories, but it should inspire something in us. Let's go home and get serious about our faith. Uh, with our families, with our church, uh, with our missions efforts in these days. This can be the generation that finishes the Great Commission. And that's what Jesus is, is pushing them way back then toward. It's like you got to don't get caught up in the, the beauty of that building. That's not what it's about. Yeah. That was to teach theology, and it's coming down, but the commission will live on yeah. in the and, people. So. And as you say, it's still the urgency of a, a yeah. Christian yeah. today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Live out. Go to Israel if you can. <laughs> well, uh, if you're but if you can't, yeah. it's okay to not go to Israel. Uh, it's gr don't, don't not go if you can. And yeah. don't be intimidated by politics. The guides are not going to let you go someplace that's crazy or dangerous. And you will feel safer in Jerusalem, especially if you're with your people. You'll feel safer there than you would in most American cities today in the downtown areas. Uh, it's just kind of the way it is. But if you can't go... We're blessed to have amazing books and Bible atlases and pictures and Bible preaching pastors and you just need to learn and grow and do virtual. I like Tabga, Heptepagon, I've jokingly said a number of times, I go there every day. Uh, I can't go back there every, you know, literally, but that's in my mind. And when I hear a message about those things, those, a picture will pop in my head from just studying it over and over and over. I teach Life of Christ in Zambia, so I've gone through the four Gospels over and over, year by year, over, repeatedly, and it just some of that becomes second nature, but I see pictures in my head when I hear another preacher talking about those sites because it's places I've been. So if you can go, go. Um, yeah, again, thank you for the pictures yeah. you put in our minds and we've, we've been able to share with you today. I, I trust you. Uh, received as much out of this as I have. But thank you so much. Yeah, well, thanks for having me down this morning. I appreciate it.